Luis and I will be presenting on how to use the um, GPU queue at JHPCE, um, and we'll use TensorQTL, uh, TensorQTL software as an example. And so this will sort of be like a two-part presentation. First, we'll go into actually like how to use the GPU itself, and then we'll focus more on the example. Um, okay, so just as a brief introduction to the GPU node at JHPCE, um, the technical sort of the technical details would be that it has um, it's a compute node at, at the cluster, and it has forty eight CPU cores, three hundred seventy six gigabytes of RAM, and most importantly, it has three different GPUs. Um, and so, why might you be interested in this? Because um, basically, recently there has been more and more GPU based software, so software leveraging graphics processing units, even if, even though they're not graphics based software. And that's because um, tasks can be um, very well parallelized on GPUs in a way, way that CPUs can't. Um, so what that means for most users is that certain software for on certain tasks can be a lot faster, basically. And um, that's sort of the, the interest behind using GPUs. Um, so uh, the public GPU node at JHPCE uh, can be accessed in a pretty typical way. You may do this for other queues. Um, so to queue RSH in to get an interactive session, you just provide it as um, the name GPU to that dash L argument here. Um, and uh, so um, that's for interactive session. And then you, you can provide your memory options or whatever like we did here. Um, for queue something, it's also pretty standard. Um, the focus here is line five in this screenshot. Uh, again, you just provide the GPU name to the dash L argument. Um, and then the C using multiple CPU cores is a, a bit different than you might expect at like the shared queue, for example. Um, there's 48 total CPU cores on the node. And when you request a single GPU, it requests 16 CPU cores. So it's a bit, it's a bit confusing. Uh, in this example, if you wanted to request more than that, you could do um, the same syntax as you would use for the shared queue, which is the dash PE local um, option. And then if you request two, that'd be 16 times two. So a total of 32 cores. Um, cool. Um, Maddie has a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I missed it. Um, let me check the chat. Or oh, it's not in the chat. You can go ahead and yeah. ask. So is the minimum number of cores that you get is always 16? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay. And is there a maximum? I'm sorry, what? Is there a maximum number of cores that you can get for the GPU? A maximum number? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, could, if you request all the ones on the node, it'd be 48. Um, but you would do that with dash PE level three. That makes sense. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, so it's a lot different than like the shared queue or other queues. Um, okay, and so this is the more complicated part. It's um, basically uh, the GPU node is a bit experimental as it stands. So normally, um, SunGrid engines, the grid schedule, the job schedule at um, JHPCE. Is responsible for like making sure individuals have exclusive access to the resources they request, but unfortunately, that's actually not the case currently. So um, users are responsible for making sure that they select a GPU that's not being used. <laughs> so by default, it's actually possible for two different users to um, select the same GPU, and then if you're running jobs that you know re require a lot of memory or something, they can they can crash when they run out of memory because two people are trying to request. Anyways, the, the focus is that you, you're responsible for picking an open device. So if you're in an interactive session, um, you can use the NVIDIA SMI commands that you see on the right on the screenshot. And that gives you information about like all the GPUs on the, the node. And um, if you look at like this volatile <laughs> GPU utilization um, column, you can see like, oh, these, the first, GPU zero and GPU one are in complete use. And the last GPU number two is like only 4% use. And you can also um, 
confirm at the bottom that the active processes running are only using GPU zero and one. So if we were in an interactive session, then we could um, set this environment variable called CUDA visible devices. We would set that to two to say that we want to all GPU based programs to use um, just the GPU two. Um, so that can be useful for interactive sessions. Um, I'm oh, sorry, I think Maddie still has her hand raised. I don't know if she has a second question. Sorry, I forgot to put that down. Sorry. Oh, good. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Um, yeah, so um, it's useful to be able to do it interactively, but often you might run into a situation where you, you want to run multiple jobs and it's such as being an array job and it would be really inconvenient if you didn't have an automated way to automatically select a GPU. Um, so how do you do that? Uh, in practice, I have some experimental code that I use um, on this right, on the right screenshot here. And it basically does what we just did in the last slide in a bit more in an automated way. So again, it uses the NVIDIA SMI commands and it checks um, the GPU, which GPUs are under by default 10% utilization. Um, and you can change these two variables at the top so you can probably keep the top one at 10, because I found that to be a good cutoff. Um, but if you want to use more than one GPU, you can obviously set this to two or something. Um, and yeah, at the bottom, it sets the CUDA visible devices command based on which GPUs it determines to have less than 10% utilization. So it's like, it's a bit experimental in that um, every once in a while, first of all, I should say that like, I could not find a standard like best practice for how to do this. So that's why it's a bit experimental, but um, so every once in a while, you'll get like a false positive. So like you'll select a GPU that's not actually three. It's pretty rare. This code works, has worked pretty well for me. Um, another limitation is that like by default, like this code here will just stop running if no GPUs are available. And one of the implications of that is that if you're, since there's only three GPUs on the node, if you ran an array job and just like ran 10 jobs at once, the first three would pick the open GPUs and then the last seven would fail. <laughs> so it's also, if you're running the rage up, it's also your responsibility here to set the um, dash TC argument um, to less than, to three or less basically. So it's a bit, um, it's a sort of a roundabout solution to something that would normally be managed by a sheet. Um, um, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? <clears throat> Does this change the name of that depending on what GPU key you're using? Uh, no, so this is actually, uh, it's a column output from the NVIDIA SMI command, so it's pretty standard. Uh, okay. Yeah, any like CUDA based software on GPUs. So yeah, any Q on, on the cluster. Uh, okay, and it might be good if you go back to the um, slide where you had the screenshot of the Q sub. Um, because yeah. this is the TC command you were referring right, right. to. And that is the number of uh, concurrent tasks, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I forgot to explain that. That's a good good note. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, I didn't mention that this is like an array job. So uh, in this example, at least, so like the dash T would be, you want to run tasks one through 12. And then, yeah, like Leo mentioned, TC2 is like two tasks at once. And so if you're running on the GPU, you don't want to exceed three because the code I had um, <laughs> here will um, just exit if you, if you do that. So anyways, yeah, it's a bit experiment, experimental, but it works decently well for now. Uh, um, are you thinking of maybe doing, adapting this um, little bit of code into like um, a bash script people could run from their own? Um, um scripts say so like let's say you put this on the um, on the modules directory right then people could like just sh this script and then pass two parameters which would be the uh, the usage cutoff and the number of gpus uh, um yeah i mean that'd be an interesting idea um that way people don't need to copy paste this code everywhere and if there's anything you need to fix over time right then only one 
location has to change type of thing yeah okay um it's a good idea um yeah because at first i was about to suggest like oh you just throw this into the beginning of your shell scripts but yeah it might be good to have a central location for this kind of code and also for now we um if you go to the r stats like google sheet we provided part of the um this segment of code is in the GitHub gist um, in the code column uh, sheet. But anyways, um, uh, the next thing you might naturally want to check is that, like, um, by default, you might be concerned, like, even though there a lot of software is GPU based, um, sometimes it'll run by um, CPU uh, on a CPU by default if you don't have things properly set up. So it's important to check like, if your software is actually using the GPUs like you think it is. Um, and so in practice, a lot of times we've had Python-based software um, and we build modules um, to isolate the Python so software in a virtual environment. And so for a user just has to load like the modules. So in this case, like I have an example of module load Tangram. So load the Tangram Python package. Um, but yeah, so to, um, verifying the use of GPU will depend on like what software you're using, but if it's a Python based software, um, based on PyTorch that we have an example here. So, um, if you're using, if it relies on the Py, PyTorch Python package, you can import torch and you can run these two commands. Um, so first is CUDA available, which should be on a GPU that's, um, an NVIDIA GPU that uses CUDA, which is what the GPU node does. So that should return true. Um, the next thing you want to do is check what device you're using. So if you set the CUDA uh, visible devices variable, you should see that is the same. So let me, let me just go back to, uh, so like in this right here, if we set it to two, in this bottom um, section, then we would have this Function to return the number two, basically. Um, so yeah, that, that's a good way to verify with PyTorch. But it might there are other methods depending on where, like what your uh, software is based on. Uh, so I think maybe if anyone has questions about this section, you can probably ask now, and then we can continue to the next section of this presentation. Yeah, otherwise, we can just continue. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. I have a quick question. Uh, maybe it's quick. Is how, like, what's the general, like, um, usage? Like, how active is the GPU nodes? Is it, like, normally only one node is in use, like, on an average? Or is it getting, is it fluctuate or? Right. Um, so I'd say maybe, yeah, like I probably one or two GPUs are, so it's, it's fairly used, I'd say, but um, they're usually, I'd say typically there's at least one GPU free. Um, yeah. So like every, like if you wanted to, to like use a GPU node, typically one is free for now. Yeah, yeah, for now, yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll see how much that increases, but um, for now, yeah, you can typically get a GPU in the wallet. And they're all, they're all, in, um, I think you said they were all the uh, CUDA based N NVIDIA. I don't know how to say that. NVIDIA? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so it's NVIDIA based graphics card that runs CUDA. The, yeah. Do, do you know if the CUDA tools is for developing on? Is that already installed in the compute node? Um, the CUDA developer toolkit, yeah, yeah, it should yeah, be. it should be there. Yeah, um, you might. I forget if you have to load a module for that or if it's just available right as is, but it's definitely on there. Um, I have to check. It's definitely installed. Thanks. Is is this? No, I'm confused. This is a single machine, right? With three. Uh, with the NVIDIA cards inside, right? Yeah, it's a single computer, okay. node, yeah. And this, how is this different from Caracol that I heard before, or is this the same? It's a different one. Um, oh, okay. yeah, this is like the publicly available one. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
All right, so I'm going to be talking about running TensorQTL um, on the GPU, which is a uh, fun little project that I've been doing with the Moods data. Um, if I can get my Zoom set up, there we go. Um, so what is TensorQTL? TensorQTL is a GPU-enabled QTL mapper. Uh, it's kind of like the next progression of fast QTL, which people might have heard about. Um, so it's like kind of based, you know, it's this, it's the same functions, but now it's like I'm um, using the uh, tensor um, and like torch from Python to run faster. Um, and it can be run via the command line or in interactively or, you know, just like with a Python script. Um, oh yeah, in QTL, quantitative trait locus. Um, as Leo pointed out. All right, so as it is, um, we're running an EQTL analysis. So we need a couple different types of data. Um, we need genotyping data. Um, so for us, that's usually um, like imputed, like currently we're using a top med imputed SNP data set for lots of projects. Um, and then sometimes you use like a RIP, uh, risk SNP subset. Um, so TensorQTL uses the bed BAM, BAM files created by Plink um, as an input. Um, it requires the expression data um, of like of your uh, from your samples. Um, you can use uh, whatever feature gene exon junction or transcript, um, and it takes the input as a bed.gz file, and then the covariates data. Um, which like is usually like whatever you're using in your model. So commonly like diagnosis, age, sex, um, and then perhaps feature PCs. Um, and then the file type is flexible if you use it interactively, basically anything that I'll read as a pandas data frame. If you do use the command line version, there is like a specific uh, tab separated text file that they want you to use. Um, but uh, this is, uh, to note here, this is a little bit more flexible as you read it in first, just with pandas before um, using it in the actual uh, TensorQTL uh, functions. Um, and then they also have an interaction analysis, um, which you can add on to one of the uh, EQTLs. And for that, you need uh, your interaction data as a vector. Um, so an example that we've tried for this is a cell fractions um, for deconvolution. And um, you read that in as a pandas series, which is kind of like a list. Um, so, it's, um, so that's kind of like the overview of all the data you need to run this. So it is quite a bit of data to wrangle and get into the correct formats. Um, KJ asked a question on the chat. Oh yeah. Uh, do the files need to be indexed like with fast QTL? Um, I don't think so, but I could be wrong. Actually, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say no, but not 100 percent sure. I never actually used fast QTL. Um, yeah, so they have a couple different flavors available from TensorQTL. They have both um, cis EQTLs, and then you can also do trans EQTLs, um, which I won't discuss here, but they also have options for, for the trans analysis. Um, but for cis EQTLs, they have three, three types. So there's the nominal, which is where they test your gene against all, of, it gives you the data basically for, for like a feature, let's say a gene, that's what I'm showing here. And then all of the SNPs in your input that are within the, like, um, the kilobase window that you define. So here we have a 500 kilobase window on either side of our gene, which is right here. Um, you know, this is like base pairs along chromosome 10. Um, and then for each dot here represents a SNP that we tested against that gene. And then um, we represent the significance of that interaction um, using the negative log 10 FDR here. So things that are higher up were more significant and like um, impacted the expression of this gene more. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of data returned here. Um, there is four, we tested, we have, it inf or, excuse me, we have data for 4,637 SNPs um, paired with this gene. I guess that would be SNP gene pairs. Um, we find six to be significant with significant at our cutoff of FDR01. Um, 
And the colors here I've represented um, the basically the SNPs that are significant across these three different analyses. So this is the one that we get returned for the most. Moving on to the CIS analysis, this is a bit different. Basically, it seeks to find the most significant SNP for each feature. And basically, it uses permutations to estimate a more accurate uh, beta p-value. So you can see that this red SNP from up here now has a lower p-value, and it is the only data returned in these CIS analysis. And then um, this data is then used for this independent, um, for the independent analysis, basically it's trying to find SNPs that are independently significant with the, for the gene and like not in, impacted by the other, by the presence of the other SNPs. So basically what it does is it has a forward step where it basically lifts SNPs that it knows are significant. And then it has a backward step where it tests all the other SNPs. So it uses the sys input to that that's added to the list beforehand. So they say, okay, we know that this red SNP is the best, most significant SNP. So it's added to the list. And then it tests all the other SNPs with that SNP in mind. Um, so basically the other SNP that it finds to be very significant is this green SNP here. Um, so basically this SNP is still significant significantly impacts this gene, even though this SNP also significantly impacts this gene. Note that we drop these other three blue SNPs up here. Um, so this is, um, so if you, if we're following along, this step uses permutations, we're testing 4,000 different SNPs, and then this has like a forward and backward step that I believe also use permutations. So it's like a lot of computations that happen. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions on this slide. It's a little complicated. Cool. All right. So um, uh, I think for this example, I used the example in the example data provided on TensorQTL. Um, so if we go take a look at the website. Uh, okay, so this is their uh, website where you can find information. They used to link you to the FASTQTL uh, documentation here, but unfortunately, this appears to be a, uh, a little bit broken. So the documentation is a little bit missing right now, which is frustrating, um, but uh, we'll work with what we can off this website. Um, yeah, so if we go, and I'm working off their example, Um, so basically they have like a, where you can um, use wget to download the, the different information that they have. So they have um, a bed, BIM, and FAM file. And then they have uh, a sample covariates text, which is that tab separated text, like um, tab separated file in text format. And then they have their expression data in an expression.bed gz. And then um, they kind of go through a couple different steps here. So they load the required packages. Um, if you notice, Torch is in here, um, and then along with TensorQTL, and then we also use Pandas to load in some data. Um, they define some paths, they load their paths, and then they have examples for running all like a bunch of different analysis. We're just going to focus on this sys, um, on this first sysmap nominal one, which is um, if we go back to here. This is kind of that simple, oops, that simple version where we're just running everything. We're just going to get data for everything. Um, yeah, so I was going to kind of explain it. So basically, the three main steps are. Um, oh, did I have it? No, oh, I thought I had. Okay, so basically, um, in our case, if we wanted to run this on JHPCE, um, basically how I've done it is basically basically define a Python script that runs TensorQTL. Um, you both. First step is to read the input. The second is to run map nominal. It's a pretty simple process here. And then I'm gonna show you how to run it both on the CPU and then on the GPU, and basically what looks different on those SH scripts. And then I have this um, code saved to uh, GitHub, GitHub gist. So if anybody wants to go uh, access it, it's here as well. All right, so, 
I have the W get code on the GitHub gist, um, but I just ran it on my computer. So I just on my uh, home directory here on JHPCE, I have a folder called um, TensorQTL test, and I have our downloaded folder files. Um, and then I have uh, this Python file, um, tensorqtl example.py. Um, so basically what we're gonna do is input pandas, import torch. Um, I guess I could actually run this for everybody. Yeah, so then I included this little message here, which is gonna take an input from the, uh, the shell scripts. Um, but basically it's gonna print whether we're running this on the CPU or on the GPU. And if you run it on the CPU, TensorQTL actually throws a warning message that's like, hey, you're running this on the CPU. Like, um, so it kind of lets you know. We're struggling to get Zoom in a place where it's not all the way in the way. Okay, there we go. Um, so we're gonna skip running this, but then basically we're defining our paths. So basically we have our plink prefix path, our expression bed file and our covariate file. And then I, um, they also use like this, basically you define like a prefix, which is like um, the, like how you're gonna save the output files. Um, for the map nominal, they save an output file automatically in what's called a parquet file, which is like um, a file that Python commonly uses to save big data, is my understanding. Um, Python people, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a second. Um, okay, so it's gonna yell at me because mode is not defined, but that's okay. Um, so then TensorQTL has a, uh, they have a function where they read in the bed. So this is like their own defined function. So we're gonna read in, from our expression bed, we're gonna extract two different tables, one that's called phenotype data frame and one that's called phenotype position data frame, which is basically gonna tell you, like for example, the phen it's a little confusing because they call it phenotype and we'd probably call it expression, but it is the expression data. Um, so the phenotype data frame, Um, so we can see here, we've got our gene IDs as row names and then our sample IDs as the column names. So it's kind of similar to what we'd usually look at in our like assay counts data from a summarized experiment object. Um, and then the phenotype um, position data frame is gonna be more similar to our um, like row ranges data where we can see the gene ID and then we know what chromosome it all is where it is. And then we also know the position of the chromosome, the position of the gene. Um, so that's important for um, EQTL analysis because we need to know where it is. So we know how close that gene is to certain SNPs. Um, And then it also, okay, so then we're using genotype IO, which is another, which is a library that I believe is loaded by TensorQTL, um, but it's gonna use this Plink reader to read in our three Plink files. Um, so this can be, um, you know, just like a VCF file, this can be quite a bit of data and be pretty big. So sometimes this takes a second and you also might need to load quite a bit of data. Or you might need quite a bit of memory when you QRSH in if you're gonna run this interactively. Oh. Wait. You also might need to actually have all the files. Which one? Ooh. I'm missing the BAM file. Uh, you mind if I ask a couple of questions? Oh, yeah. Sure. Uh, do you have to, uh, well, now I have like two questions. The first one is, 
when it's reading these in, can you tell it to you, is it automatically a CPU to do this reading into this big data or do they have a mode to run thing to load stuff with CUDA? Cause like PyTorch does, mm. you just turn it on and then suddenly it uses CUDA versus CPU or is it all doing? That's a good question. I'm not totally sure um, if it uses that to load the data. Um, in my experience, it doesn't like message or anything that it's using the CPU to load the data um, versus like the. Um... So yeah, it, uh, I think you're asking like, does it use the GPU by default? And so yeah. if you, um, we do have a TensorQTL module and if you load that, then it, it's set up like Python is um, installed in that module to be um, like linked against CUDA. So it does use the GPU by default. Okay, yeah. So here I haven't loaded the module, but in the SH scripts I have, I like, I, I load the module up. So that would have been better. So if I loaded the module before, then I think it would, if I'm correct, Nick. Yeah, that's right. I was trying to figure out why they needed PyTorch, and unless they're using like internal PyTorch stuff to turn on CUDA, maybe. Um, sorry, I connect right here. Yeah, the, it's not, it's like too technical. Uh, the other question I was wondering is if you, if it automatically does chunking, whether or not you tell it to do one chromosome or all the chromosomes, is it automatically going to split up the total data across the available processes? Because I know in your example, you're using one chromosome. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I might need more investigation. Yeah, I would like the question, like the, I think that what I really want to know is, do you have to specify by hand all the chromosomes or if you just put everything together, it will do it on its own? Um, if you put everything together, it'll, it'll, it'll run it. Um, you don't have to run like chromosome one, then chromosome two. Um, and then it gives for the sysmap nominal, it gives you outputs by chromosome too. Um, yeah, the, yeah, I, fi I figured the output would, well, no, I didn't know that. So do you need, so is there another script that combines it, like a chunking script? And uh, not at least that they provide or like make clear in their um, like, uh, documentation that's up. I've basically dealt with all of the output like in R. Um, yeah. So I don't think so, which I, is a I, little I, bit I, of a wrestling match then down the line. Um, yeah, I say this because we we use the fast QTL a lot and they you have to input how many chunks you want to split it up hmm. because it then will use a certain number of threads. And so this is the advanced form and I'm trying to see like, would you need to specify how to chunk or is it doing this automatically for optimization based off of the available resources and then after that um, the qtl has like a helper python script which is just combines all the, the files it just concatenates everything and and then removes all the junk stuff yeah i mean that might be something that i'm missing somewhere um like i said their uh, documentation could be a little bit better um but uh yeah, that'd be helpful. Right now, I just do it in R because that's like kind of where I'm more comfortable working. But potentially, there's uh, room for improvement on on my usage as well. Maybe we should get together. <laughs> but um, cool. Yeah. So I'm redownloading. I was missing the bed file from this uh, folder I have here. So I'm redownloading that. Um, but let's see. Um, give that a couple of seconds. Um, basically. But I think that the, basically it's just gonna load the genotype file and then um, then it kind of like um, splits it into two different um, uh, data frames here. One that has like the genotype data and then one that has the variant positions, which is kind of equivalent to up here when we had the um, phenotype positions. And then basically it takes all, um, so now we're up to what? One, two, three, 
four or five, we've got five different data frames. It takes five different data frames into the map nominal. So it takes genotype data frame, variant data frame, and then down here, um, you can see that, um, uh, like the KJ just pointed out, that it takes the phenotype data frame and then it splits it into just chromosome 18. So we're filtering just to chromosome 18. And then it does the same for the phenotype positions. It splits it just to chromosome 18. Um, and then we're also using our prefix, um, which is going to tell it what the output should be named. And then it's going to give it our covariate data frame as well. And then you can specify an output directory too. Um, so ours is just called output. And then um, I basically set up two little checks, a start time and an end time, just so we compare the run times between the CPU and the GPU. Um, and now if my download finishes, we can run our little example. But I guess I'll uh, go over the shell scripts real quick. So this is the just regular CPU one. So this is probably a shell script that people are familiar with. Um, so, you know, when you log into a node or tell it what compute, or I guess like, um, Q to be in. So here we're in Blue Jay. Um, we're going to load memory. This one takes 50 to run. Um, and then we're going to use TensorQTL. So that's like the module that allows it to run on the GPU. But here, I believe it does run on the CPU because we didn't specify a GPU um, uh, queue. And then we're going to just, just list our module to like just that's going to be part of our log. And then we're going to tell it to run this script, Python Tensor. TensorQTL example, and then we're going to tell it that we're running it on the CPU. And then in contrast for the GPU, a lot of this top stuff looks the same, except now we're specifying that we want to be in the GPU queue. Um, and then I've also labeled our outputs to be a little different. Um, TensorQTL GPU, um, it's the name of the job, and then the name of our log file. And then here I have that code that Nick was discussing earlier, where we're going to, um, we're loading our TensorQTL, which is going to have like the GPU enabled TensorQTL code in it. Um, we're going to then run this code, which is going to make sure that there is available GPUs for us to use. And then we're going to just, the same as the last file, run this and then give it the little GPU flag, which doesn't actually do anything for TensorQTL, it was just for our usage. All right, so now I'm going to exit out of here because, oh. Um, all right, so now I have all my files. Cool. So now I can like just Q sub. Um, and then we can do GPU as well. Okay, so we can see. That we've got one of these running on Blue Jay, and then I think the GP one is queued. Give it a second. Okay, so yeah, so now we've got them both running. And we've got the CPU and the GPU both running. Cool. All uh, right. Does anybody have any questions now, um, seeing how those are run differently? All right. Cool. So now if we take a look at our logs. Oh, I think I forgot to delete my test logs, but it'll just concatenate at the bottom. We'll be fine. Um, so these are running. When I ran them before, they took about a minute. Um, so, you know, that's just one chromosome. So, um, this can take quite a bit of time, uh, especially if you're using like a bigger data set than they were using. Um, or like, you know, you probably want to run all 26 chromosomes or, you know, 23. And so that takes like, you know, it adds up. Um, uh, would you say running the top med data for all chromosomes takes more than an hour using tensor? Um, you know, I haven't run the nominal on the GPU because we kind of did that later. So I don't have a real time for you. Okay, so this is, I don't know why that doesn't want to load. Um, 
So maybe while this is still running, I can go over my other slides, which were related to how to get to these type of input files um, from you know, maybe data that we're more familiar with. Um, yeah, so how to use this with uh, Libra style data. So they use the bed bim bam, or wait, this is a fam, not bam, um, on the VC, uh, instead of a VCF. So VCF is probably like more commonly how we store our genotype data for like RNA-seq type um, analyses. Um, so you have to kind of use Plink to make these bed files. So that's a pretty simple Plink command. So that's easy enough. Um, and then you get your expression in covariate data, uh, mostly from your summarized experiment object. You might have some of your PCs stored elsewhere, but like for the most part, they're probably in your summarized experiment. And then you have to be careful because your sample IDs need to match your IDs in the VCF. So commonly we're using like RNA-seq data, which like um, we store as like R numbers or has its own sample ID that we use as like um, a column name in a summarized experiment. Um, and then in the VCF, we use kind of like the like subject numbers or sometimes we call it genome sample or brain number. So you kind of have to be careful that you can't just use the RNA number, the RNA sample label to match it up because it won't know that those are from the same individual, right? So you have to kind of like rename your columns to being the um, like the genome sample or the brain number, depending on what's in your VCF. Um, so that's that's a tricky thing to watch out for. And then especially like, for example, in the moods data, um, we're working with samples from two different brains. And like basically there's an example from each individual in both regions. So like you have to kind of work with those two regions separately. Otherwise, you're going to end up with duplicate column names, which doesn't doesn't work. So yeah, you have to work with like regions separately. So I, I kind of made a little question. breakdown of like where you get this data from. Is that a, a question? Question about yeah. the last slide. Do, do the does the order of the brain, the num names matter? Um, so I do, I do think it matters. So I think that like looking at it matters if that's QTL too. So yeah, it does matter because like I don't think they actually consider the names in if we fast forward. I think it's the expression data where it's just kind of like column nameless. And I think it's just based on the index. So like you have to be a little careful with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So good point from KJ. You also have to make sure that they match. Um, yeah. So then kind of just like a breakdown of where this stuff comes from, from our summarized experiment, which is kind of commonly how we work with this data. Um, so your expression data is probably going to be your data from your assays and then also row data, which tells you like where that, um, where that gene is. Um, so you need to convert this all to a bed GZ format. You need to include the, pos the feature position and other feature position information that includes the chromosome number in the start. And they also want you to include the end on there, which is start plus one. That's a little weird. That's not like, you know, what we actually consider the end of that feature. So that's kind of like a weird, weird thing. Um, and then from the covariate data, um, you need to, this is probably data from your call data. So like sex agent and diagnosis is like commonly used. Um, and then plus feature PCs and other things that you want to correct for. Um, so this all needs to be in numeric. So you have to watch out for categorical variables like sex or diagnosis. Um, so kind of using, we use model matrix to convert this into uh, a matrix that works for that. So basically it turns like sex, male and female into like zero and one. Um, so that, that's kind of how we worked with that. And then they recommend a tab separated text format, um, but really you only need it to be in that strict of a format if you're using the command line version. Um, anything that'll read into Panda's data frame will work. And this has the, uh, the, the column numbers. So this is kind of an example of what the data that we're currently running looks like. Um, so this is like their bed file. Um, so we're seeing that like we've got our gene names, and then this is kind of the data from the row data where they've got chromosome one, and then they've got the start here. And then we have the end here, which is start plus one. I notice that that's the same for all of these. Um, so this is our information from the row data. And then this is the information like from assays counts um, where we have like, this is the expression and then whatever V5, I believe is this sample number. 
Um, so this is the expression data for all of these, or the like the counts for all of these. Um, so that's how that works. And um, then the covert question from KJ on the chat about whether it's um, normalized or raw counts. Um, so this is their data, which um, I don't really know what's going on with here, but I think we did use normalized. I, I would guess it is normalized because you have like negative values. So yeah, yeah, that would that would make sense. Yeah. I don't know how you get negative counts otherwise, unless something there's something I don't know. Um, and then in this genotype file, there is not just one uh, chromosome. I believe it's the full data set. Um, they just use chromosome 18 as an example. Oh, that was actually from a while ago, but that's fine. Um, and then the covariate data. Um, so this is kind of similar to like our call data. So we have, well, it's flipped. Um, they kind of, they use it kind of like um, in the transposed version of how we look at it. So here is like our sample. And then here we have PC1, PC2, or PC1 through five. And we have values for that. Um, they have like an inferred, like, you know, I'm not exactly sure what this value, value is, but they use it as part of their covariates. And then I pulled up, uh, their sex covariate to show you that they use like one and two as categorical rather than like um, male or female. Um, yeah, so this should have run now. Hopefully I'm cyber, oh. okay, cool. So we've got our two log files. I guess maybe we look at the outputs first. Yeah, so basically we got a parquet data from our, sys, our GPU run and our CPU run, and um, they are different sizes, which is interesting. I don't quite accept, know why. When I did that before, they are the same size. So um, stay tuned. And then for the logs file, we can take a look at the different run times that we got. Okay, so yeah, we can see in this output, um, we're loading our stuff. Um, they load up the, we're loading our version. So it notes the version of PyTorch pandas that it's running. And then here's our message, we're running it on the CPU. So this was a message that I added to this code just to show the difference in the log files. Um, so it loads up all those mapping files, gives you a little loading bar, and then it says start mapping. And then it has 445 samples, 310 phenotypes. Um, so samples, and it's running 301 genes, and there's 26 covariates provided. And then over, we're looking at what, 13 million variants? Um, I feel like that's not totally true. I feel like that's over the whole thing. Um, so then it's checking all of these phenotypes out, and then it basically just gives you a little um gives you like a you know tells you how far along it is and then it says this is our message time elapsed um okay let's this is their time elapsed and then um this was the output that we had Oop. nominal runtime done uh, cool. and then we can look at the gpu one And then that was from the last, okay. Scroll too far. Okay, so same thing, um, except now we're running it on the GPU. And then it goes through the same process. It tells you what your data looks like, goes through, it runs all of these different phenotypes, and then it's 0.7 minutes. Um, and then the actual runtime is like a little bit less than the CPU one. Um, so that really adds up when you're running lots and lots of data. Yeah, so we can see that it's 1.24 versus 0 0.7. And then um, the runtime, I guess, like clocked by the Python, you, doing the time on Python is a little different. I'm not sure why, but um, I'm not sure what it counts. Like um, this might count the actual just processing the phenotype time, not like loading all of that data into the function but um, it counted by start and stop before and after that function, we do see that it takes about half as long. So that's an improvement, especially when we have lots and lots of data to run. 
um, because they ran 300 genes, but like for the Moods project, for instance, we're running like 25,000 genes. So it's a, quite a bit of a quite a bit of a slog to get through all that data. Um, so does anybody have any questions here? How different are the results? Did you check if they're actually identical or maybe due to, I mean, correlated at least due to floating? Point? Yeah, they should be identical. Um, I got the same, they were the same size when I tried this example yesterday. I'm not quite sure why they're a little bit different now. I don't think we have time to go um, through those results, um, but uh, I could check it out because that's definitely something we'd want to know. Um, all cool. right. Awesome. Um, thank you, Luis. Thank you, Nick.